The premise of the book is that in the 19th century after the Civil War, American culture was uh, being uh, dramatically recast, reformulated, and really reconstructed along with the nation itself. And what my co-author Rob Cruz at the University of Amsterdam and I sought to explore was how American mass culture uh, both took form in the United States, how it was exported to Europe, and how it became a way by which um, many, many Europeans uh, uh, got to know the United States and America. So we looked at the transmission, the rise of American mass culture, the transmission of American mass culture, and the reception of American mass culture forms in Europe between the end of the Civil War and the 1920s. Well, it starts really at the end of the Civil War, and it begins with the question of how, um, after a Civil War, do you reconstruct, how do you put a country back together again? And, of course, many historians look at the political system. They look at how um, a national political structure gets reassembled. And what we argued is that in addition to this, what one needs to do is take into account how a culture or how many cultures get put back together again as part of a uh, reformation of the United States. The United States becomes a, a real interesting entity because it's growing by leaps and bounds. There's increased immigration. and Americans are confronted with a, a, a real challenge in terms of this um, uh, process of reconstruction. How do you do it? How really do you get people of different backgrounds, not just North and South, not just people who uh, come from different ethnic backgrounds, who've been in the United States some, sometimes for many centuries, but now new immigrants, how do you get people to imagine themselves as Americans? And that's where the story of American mass culture gets to be real interesting because American mass cultural forms, uh, the rise of dime novels, um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West, um, World's Fairs, all of these become pretty important aspects for um, getting Americans to think of themselves as Americans. One could argue that um, Americans have been exporting their values and um, ideas for a good long while. But um, in a lot of ways, this really begins uh, with a World's Fair in London, uh, the first World's Fair, an international exhibition in, um, held in London, the Crystal Palace Exhibition, 1851, when American manufacturers began to put something called America, the American system of manufacturing mass production on exhibit. And then that really picks up um, uh, speed after the Civil War. And what we argue in the book is that in many respects, it's Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which takes form in the United States in the early 80s, early 1880s, really becomes part of a, um, uh, an export process that sweeps the United Kingdom and much of the continent of Europe uh, between the 1880s and the first part of the 20th century. So it's through these outdoor, call them exhibitions and spectacles that uh, European Americans and Europeans begin to think probably anew about what American culture is all about. There are multiple perceptions of the United States depending on whether you are an imperial power, whether you're a government, whether you're a business person, uh, whether you're an ordinary person, whatever that means. So uh, there are multiple perceptions of America, I, but I, I, guess, uh, I guess the common denominator uh, across Europe is a tremendous curiosity about this place that had just, I mean, Europeans have been fighting among themselves for a good long while. Uh, the United States had not seemed so united in the middle of the 1860s, um, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people killed. Um, how, how could this place come back? How could it, how could it basically be something different? Uh, could it be different? Could it be better? So there's a tremendous curiosity about, about the United States, about, about America, about Americans. And you know, that's part of a long dialogue. It goes, it goes back before the Civil War, but it picks up momentum after that conflict. The European reaction to Buffalo Bill is um, it's really pretty interesting um, because Europeans had really not seen this kind of traveling show on this scale before. And because Buffalo Bill centered the Wild West, he never called his show a show, he called it an authentic uh, representation of the American West, and he traveled with um, animals, he traveled with bison, with elk, with deer, of course horses, he had cowboys with him, he also had um, Native Americans with him. And I think the overwhelming reaction of most of the audiences 
was one of utter amazement. And it's not just what they saw in the arena with people dashing around on horses, these feats of tremendous athleticism. I think what also impressed them was the way the, sh the show, I'll call it a show, the way it was actually set up. And it was so portable, it was so remarkable to see this representation of, um, of nature, of the Wild West, uh, really set up using the latest in uh, techniques, um, electrical power plants, uh, billboards, uh, saturation media advertising, incredible organization of all of these actors. You have to feed them, you have to get them moved from place to place, and just the sheer um, organizational genius of Buffalo Bill uh, reflected not just the Wild West, but some pretty profound changes in the way American business life itself was uh, being reorganized with uh, the development of industrial organization, new emphasis on efficiency and all of that. The American government um, intervenes not financially, at least not directly, but the government gets involved because the show involves a lot of Native Americans and there's a, a, a real tension between um, Indian reformers, Indian agents, and American Indians, and a big argument about whether American Indians should be allowed to um, uh, participate in the show as quote-unquote savages, or whether they should be represented as um, uh, people who are uh, perfectly capable of becoming modern Americans wearing modern dress. So this whole Indian reform school movement, which is really quite a tragic episode in American history, plays out in the, the debates over the Wild West show. But that said, what's interesting about the Wild West is that it does um, intersect with American foreign policy and the rise of America's um, uh, stature after the Civil War within a generation to becoming a global power. So the show itself becomes really interesting as a testament of America's global reach. So increasingly as the show develops across the 1880s, 1890s, early 20th century, the people involved as performers in the show um, include not only American Indians, but uh, Japanese, Malaysians, Syrians, people from across the Middle East. So there is this sense that this um, Congress of uh, performers, this Congress of Rough Riders, as they came to be known, really reflect, reflects the ability of the United States, personified by Buffalo Bill, to round up the rest of the world and put them on show. So there are these really interesting overlays between this show as a private enterprise and certain aspects of American foreign policy. So. One of the things we try to tease out a little bit is the relationship between entertainment, pop culture, mass culture, and foreign policy. And for people, for some people, that might may seem really kind of odd, but there are these iconic photographs of Elvis um, in uh, Berlin uh, during the, uh, the, the Cold War. Uh, I've got Willis Conover, whose show is broadcast, Voice of America, a jazz program broadcast into the Soviet Union. And I think as we speak today, um, uh, the American basketball star Dennis Rodman is um, in North Korea trying to uh, win the release of some American um, uh, missionaries. So it's really interesting how you get this intersection of foreign policy and entertainment and celebrity. By the time you're in the First World War, uh, the government uh, completely embraces American mass entertainment, um, especially its text techniques of uh, getting the word out about the American perspective on World War I. So there's this very interesting government organization uh, set up called the Committee on Public Information. George Creel controls it. Uh, and this basically functions uh, as the propaganda arm of the U.S. government, not just putting messages out about what the world sees about American involvement in the war, but also uh, it becomes deeply involved in shaping those messages by censoring um, motion pictures. So in Lower Manhattan, the Office of Naval Intelligence is involved. Um, uh, they have uh, several dozen people uh, working in, uh, you know, I'm not sure they're dark rooms, maybe they have windows, but probably dark rooms. And they have scissors and they look at films that Hollywood's producing and they, you know, basically say, well, if you want to export this film overseas, you're going to have to get rid of these particular scenes. So all of the great American um, uh, Hollywood producers, all of the, the directors, all of them have their films subject to censorship. Um, 
By the same token, uh, what's interesting in all of this is that the government is relying on film, a product, a reflect, a product of a reflection of mass culture to get its um, message out overseas. So what you find by World War I is that American mass culture is not just developing, it has developed. It's part and parcel of American life and part and parcel of how people overseas are understanding who we are. Oh, well, the globalization of American culture is, of course, a, a, a ceaseless um, uh, topic for conversation and debate. Um, and the, the issues that we address in the book, um, how should one think about globalization? Um, should we think about it in terms of its impact um, on other cultures? Does it erase local cultural forms? Um, should we think of globalization in terms of American imperialism? Um, which runs the risk of treating people in other cultures as somehow passive victims? Um, or do we basically look at um, uh, the reception of American cultural products? Um, where do you locate your McDonald's? Um, how do you actually advertise it? Um, what do American cultural products signify? And this is work that a lot of people in anthropology are engaged in, so um, uh, cultural studies. So it's an ongoing um, uh, field of, of interest and raises loads of uh, just really interesting questions about what's going on now. And I guess the point of the book was to try to contextualize that and to suggest that if we look at the history, the rise of American mass culture, its reception overseas, that. Um, People around the world have had a rather longer experience, I think, than many people today realize, thinking about American cultural forms, working with them. So just extending this debate out a little bit to give it a little bit of history, I think, has been um, uh, really interesting.